إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلق من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam In the last couple of weeks we've been talking about several diseases that plague our hearts and from amongst the most deadly of those diseases it is arrogance and conceit and so what I would like to share with you today are a few stories of some of the pious predecessors some great men during the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam many of you sitting here are all too familiar with the closest and most beloved companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. A man who dedicated his life to supporting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his mission. And after his death alayhi salatu wa sallam would become the first leader of the Muslim nation. Who had great standing and rank amongst his peers and amongst the general body of Muslims that they looked up to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq as a leader, as a fatherly figure, as one who gives advice, as one that sets examples. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, one of the greatest personalities in our history. It was reported that during the time of the life of the Prophet Wasallam, he used to milk goats for several elderly women of Medina. And that he would do this on a regular basis. On a weekly basis, he would go out to the, to the farm and he would milk goats. And he would take that milk and deliver it to these elderly women that had no one to help them. And so after the death of the Prophet wasallam, when he was appointed to be the leader, to the, be the ruler of the Muslims, the ladies, they said, we have no one to help us now that you've become the ruler. Traditionally, when the person is given such status and power, such authority and position, that they change their demeanor, their attitude, their outlook on life. They become better. They become higher. The heart is now dealing with several issues leading to arrogance and conceit. Their nose, it is raised in the air. They don't take part in meagerly minor things of society, but they're focused on the real big issues. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, after he was appointed to be the leader, he continued to serve the elderly woman of al Medina by milking those same goats and delivering it to the same women. It was also reported that even during his time as the Khalifa, as the leader, he would help other women of Medina by cleaning and sweeping out their homes. Another one of the great examples of our history is Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. The second in command after Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. One of the most strong personalities that you find in the Muslim history. Known for his bravery and courage, his strength. He was feared by his enemies. And he became the leader after 
the passing of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And by this time, the Muslims were now engaged with Rome and Persia. And their nation was expanding into those territories. And so, the king of Persia, he sent a messenger to find the leader of the Muslim nation. So the messenger came into al Medina, and he began to ask, where is your leader's palace? Coming from Persia, the ruler, the leader, they live in palaces. They live in large homes, fortified buildings, beautiful structures, everything you could imagine, gold and jewelry and diamonds and glory and fame. And so he was shocked to his core when one of the Muslims said, our leader does not live in a palace. He said, well, show me where he lives. And so one of the Muslims came out and took the messenger from Persia and began to take him around the city looking for Umar ibn al-Khattab. And they're looking left and right and all over Medina and they could not find him, not in his home, not in the marketplace, not in the masjid. And finally, they stumbled upon him on the outskirts of al Medina, sleeping under a tree. SubhanAllah. The leader of the nation, the responsibility and the authority, the power, and he was found sleeping quietly under a tree like a normal, ordinary person would have been found that day. And so the messenger from Persia was shocked even more to see that the leader that was now toppling the Persian Empire, having the emperor of Persia send the messenger to sign some treaty, the one who was responsible for all of that was found sleeping under a tree. Similarly, you find other of the great companions of the Prophet wasallam, Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu anhu, who was a Persian, one of the great supporters of the Prophet wasallam, early on. And one day he was sitting with the tribe of Quraysh. And some of the members of this tribe, they began to talk about their money, their riches. And they were taking pride in this. It was a, it was a competition to see who's better, who's richer, more wealthy, who has this and that. And so Salman al-Farisi was sitting amongst them. And so they went one at a time, each of them naming off their accomplishments and what they had done and what they have and their power and their authority. And then finally they came around to Salman al-Farisi, who at the time was a Amir. He was a governor. And he said to them, أَمَّا أَنَا أَوَّلِي نُطْفَةٌ قَدِرَةٌ He says, my beginning, it is one drop. That's how I began my life. And then he went on and said, ثُمَّ أَسِيرُ جِفَةً مُنْتِنَ And then I will, I will become a foul-smelling corpse. Then there will come the scales of good deeds and bad deeds. And if my scale is light, then I will be blameworthy. But if my scale of good deeds is heavy, then I will be noble. Then I will be notable. Then I will have something amongst all of these people displaying to the people of Quraysh just like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and Abu al-Khattab the true nature of humility. The opposite of arrogance. These men, leaders, rulers, companions of the Prophet wasallam, respected and honored, loved figures the world over. They were able to overcome their arrogance. The disease found in the heart by their overwhelming humility. Their humble character. And to be honest with you, we could expect nothing more than that from these men. We could expect nothing more than that from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They were the followers of divine guidance and inspiration. 
Humility. It is a quality of the messengers and the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best of mankind. The cream of the crop. From Adam, Nuh, Musa, Ibrahim, Isa, and then finally Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of them abused their authority. None of them misused their power. But they were constantly humble first to Allah, their Lord and Creator. And then they were humble with their flock and followers. Of course, the last of them, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final messenger of Allah azza wa jal. It was actually reported or recently written in a book, the author's name, Michael H. Hart. He authored a book called The One Hundred. Now this wasn't a Muslim author, this was a Christian author. And he wrote this book called The One Hundred, and it's called A Ranking of the Most Influential Persons in History. And he says in that book that the number one most influential person in the history of mankind was none other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in both religious and secular realms was the most influential person. And this author amongst other people believed that Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam and his role in the development of Islam was far more influential than the role of Jesus. Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, peace be upon him, was for the development of Christianity. He says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the central figure in the development of this faith. He was active as a social reformer, a diplomat, a merchant, a philosopher, an orator, a legislator, a military leader, a humanitarian, humanitarian and philanthropist. The Prophet sallallahu with all of these roles, with all of this authority, with all of this influence, he was a man of humble beginnings, born as an orphan, born and his father passed away. The Prophet sallallahu growing up with this status only shortly after his birth that his mother would pass away as well leaving him abandoned. And in that society, the orphans, they were the lowest of the low. They had no mother. And especially they had no father. They had no honor, to, honor or dignity. But they were looked down upon as a burden of society. The Prophet wasallam humble beginnings. And when he was chosen by Allah to be the prophet of this nation and to all of mankind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa abdan rasula aw malikan nabiyya as it's been reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given a choice by Allah to be either a servant messenger or a king prophet to be either like a slave and a servant lowly and humble and deliver the message or to be a king, rich, with power, and at the same time deliver the message. The job would get done. The message would be delivered. And there were king messengers before him. There were king prophets before him like Suleiman, alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an lillah. Out of his humility for Allah, he chose to be a servant messenger. He chose to be humble and to lower himself in front of his Lord, Allah Azza wa Jal. And this can be seen that one time there was a man, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, someone that had yet to meet him. And when he saw that it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he began to shake. Like many of us would do if we met the president or we met the king or we met some of us a famous basketball star or a sports figure. That when you see somebody that you're so enamored and impressed with, that it's so amazing of stature and status, that you become nervous and anxious and you can't control yourself. Often you can't speak to them, people lose their words. Some people often faint in the presence of people that they admire to that level. And this man was exactly the same. When he saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he began to shake and uncontrollably, uncontrollably shake. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Hawan alayk. 
Calm down. Relax. For in the less to be Malik, I'm not a king. I'm not a king, some big person. Inna ana ibn umra'atin min Quraysh kana takulu al qadid. He says, I'm only the son of a woman from Quraysh who used to eat dried meat. Humble beginnings. The Prophet wasallam, his nose didn't go up in the air. He was not proud that somebody's trembling in front of him. But he was worried that the person was overreacting to his status. Humility of the Prophet wasallam, it can be found throughout his life. One of the companions came and said to Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asking her, هَلْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَعْمَلُ فِي بَيْتِهِ شَيْئًا Saying, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever do anything in his house? Like, did he ever do any chores? Which for many of us is, honestly speaking, for many of us men, is often below us to do chores, to do the washing up and the cleaning and the sweeping, mending the clothes and taking care of the kids. Especially, it depends on your culture. The Prophet wasallam was the opposite of that. As his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, Naam, kana Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaghsifu na'lahu wa yakhithu thawbahu wa ya'malu fi baytihi kama ya'malu ahadukum fi baytihi. He says the Prophet, she said the Prophet sallallahu he used to mend his own sandals. Today, if your shoe breaks, you just toss it in the, in the trash. You don't have time, patience, or even think it's worth mending it yourself. The Prophet sallallahu would mend his own sandals. If a hole was found in his clothes, he would sew it by himself. He wouldn't hand it off to his wife. This is women's work. This is below me. Here's my sandals. Fix them. Here's my clothes. Mend them. And she says that he used to work in the house just like any of you work in the house. It was also reported that the Prophet Sallallahu he spent his time at home as Aisha radiallahu anha said, fi mihnati ahlihi, that he was at the service of his family, that he would spend his time seeing to the needs of the family, cooking if needed, cleaning if needed, going out to the market if needed. And then when the salah time came, the prayer was established, he would leave the house and go to the masjid for prayer. Is this the behavior of a leader? Is this the behavior of a ruler? I challenge you today to look at any one of the leaders, Muslim or non-Muslim alike, presidents, kings, military leaders, and to see their behavior. The Prophet wasallam. similarly, it was reported that he used to go to all of the funeral prayers. If the person was poor or rich, black or white, high or low status, he would attend their funeral prayers and he would answer their invitations, regardless of who it was. Someone coming to ask them for dinner. Didn't matter what the food was. If he was having the most expensive food or the lowliest and cheap things, the Prophet ﷺ would give his own time to each and every one of his companions, regardless of who they were, out of his great, humble nature. The Prophet وسلم, as a leader, he didn't just order work to be done, but he worked alongside of his companions, alongside of his subjects, if you would. During the battle of Al-Khandaq, the battle of the trench, when the enemies of the Muslims from the Quraysh were going to come into Medina and to attack them, they decided to dig a moat around the city, to dig a ditch as a defensive measure. And so the Prophet ﷺ ordered them to begin digging a ditch. He was the first of them to get down and carry the stones and the rocks and the dirt out. Until he was completely covered in dirt and he led them in poems to keep their spirits high while they were working. The Prophet ﷺ, he rejected any type of un- warranted respect or praise. The Prophet ﷺ was once sitting, excuse me, he came to a group of people that were once sitting, 
And when he arrived, they began to stand up in his presence, like you would see at any place where there's some figure of status. They come in the room and you stand up out of respect. You stand up honoring that person for their position. MashaAllah. Look, it's the president, it's the governor, it's the movie star, it's the king. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, لا تقوموا كما يقوم العاجم Do not stand like the non-Muslims, they stand for each other. يُعَظِّمُ بَعْضَهُمْ بَعْضًا They are just raising each other up in rank to, to, to feed the fuel of arrogance, to praise one another undeservingly. It is just feeding the diseases of the heart. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, your beloved leader, messenger, your role model, the closest chosen friend of Allah azza wa jal, the leader of the world, if he wanted to, and there was not one atom's weight of arrogance in his heart. It was nothing but humility and humbleness. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم. ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضاه ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Brothers and sisters, humility Humility It is the opposite of wanting to be lofty and looked up to. It is the opposite of feeling like you are better than others. Seeing that you are in a more powerful position, that you are above someone, that your nose begins to go up and you begin to look down on others. This is humility. This is an order from our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala found in the Qur'an in Shu'ara when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says وَاخْفِذْ جَنَاحَكَ لِمَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ and be kind and humble to the believers that follow you be kind and humble to the believers that follow you this is a quality of Ahlul Jannah, the people of paradise that while they were in this world they were humble they had humility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ يَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًا Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, this is the next life, the hereafter, and it has been made for those who do not want to be of high status and lofty. They do not want to be looked up to. They do not want to be honored and raised. It was once asked to one of the great scholars of the past, al fudayr ibn Iyab. They said, what is tawalba? What is humility? And he says, humility, it is submitting yourself to the truth and letting the truth direct you. The truth being a source of your direction. Even if you heard the truth from a young boy, even if you heard the truth from someone below you, Someone who could perhaps be the most ignorant of mankind and they said a word of truth that you will follow it. Even if you heard the truth from your enemy, you will follow it. Even if you heard the truth from someone or something that you do not like, you will follow it because you are humble first with your Lord and Creator Allah True humility only comes from recognizing Allah's greatness. It only comes from recognizing the majesty and glory, power and might of our Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is sincere humility. And when weakness of the heart and soul sets in, and you feel as if you are in trouble, sick, the heart is plagued with these types of diseases. And your nose begins to turn upward, and you begin to look down, you remember that the only one who owns everything, the dominion is in his hand is Allah Azza wa Jal. The first, 
the last. To him all things shall return. How do you stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal? The greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you compare yourself to that greatness? When you look at it in that light, it doesn't matter between us who is bigger or better. No one will ever, ever be as great as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you can remember this, your soul will be humbled in front of your Lord. And your heart will be at rest in the veneration and the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you will be humble first with Allah, following His orders, staying away from His prohibitions. It is arrogance that you live a life of sin and you are intentionally living that way. If you make a mistake, if you slip up, if you forget, if you are overcome for a moment, and then you return back and you repent and you remember Allah. Of course, this is something that's expected from all of us. كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ خَطَى Every child of Adam makes mistakes. They're sinners. وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And the best of the sinners are those who repent. They are not trying and intentionally living this way because that would be considered arrogance. I don't have to listen to you, Rabb. I don't have to listen to you, Lord. I don't have to follow your commandments. Secondly, you will be obedient. Excuse me, you will be humble with your prophet and messenger. Following his guidance, the best guidance of mankind. And then finally, you will have humility with your neighbors, your family, and your community members. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts, to guide us to that which is correct, to keep our feet firmly rooted in faith, and to join us together in al-Jannah, Allahumma ameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Inna ka hamidun majid. Wa akhiru da'wana. Inna alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa aqmi salah.